Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you about uh, what is really a very simple trial that's entirely funded by the prostate cancer charity um, and really hopes to improve the outcomes of prostate radiotherapy using simple and very cost-effective measures. Now, we're at the Royal Institution here and walking up the corridor, you see all those pictures of Nobel Prize winners who have done this amazing new discovery research, but radiotherapy is far from a new discovery. In fact, we've been, to we've been treating patients with radiotherapy for 115 years now, since Madame Curie discovered radium back in the 1890s. But we have come a very, very long way since then. And here are just a few examples of the sort of things that we are doing on a daily basis now at Mount Vernon Cancer Centre. We're treating patients with radiotherapy using techniques like, such as intensity modulated radiotherapy that you can see on the left hand side and cyber knife radiotherapy on the right hand side, which allows me to deliver very high doses of radiation to the prostate gland while sparing those very sensitive normal tissues that surround the prostate gland. But despite these incredible technological advances that have occurred over the last few years, some men do not remain disease-free in the long term. We can do better. We need to do better. So the purpose of this trial is to apply some very basic science to the radiotherapy planning process with a view to curing more men at the stage when they have localised disease. Now, so there's going to be a little bit of science, but I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. Now, we've known since the 1950s that radiotherapy is critically dependent on oxygen for its effect. We know that radiotherapy actually uses oxygen to produce molecules called free radicals that then go on to damage the DNA of cancer cells and produce the death of the cancer cell. It's a process called oxidation. It requires oxygen. So in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, there were a whole series of clinical trials with small numbers of patients that looked to improve the oxygen content of tumours during radiotherapy. But each of these trials had low numbers. Some of them used extremely eccentric techniques to do it, and it was never going to catch on. And it was only in the 1990s when this scientific paper was produced, when all of these, these trials were pulled together, that we realized that survival could be increased significantly if you increase the oxygenation of tumors at the time of their radiotherapy. And you can see here that actually, 13%, there's 13% more people alive 10 years after their radiotherapy if they'd had some form of oxygen enhancement during their radiotherapy. Now, if I was a drug company and I had a drug that produced a 13% improvement in survival 10 years after radiotherapy, then my shareholders would be dancing and my directors would be going down to the Ferrari garage to place their orders for next year's car. But it's not a drug, it's oxygen. It, we're surrounded by oxygen. You can't patent it. You can't market it. It's not very fashionable research. And in many ways, this was the downfall of this line of research back in the 1990s. And it was sidelined for more fashionable research such as genetics and, and um, molecular biology. However, there has been a resurgence in recent years because the science is sound and the need remains. Now, in, the prostate, in prostate cancer, we know that prostate cancer is, in fact, one of those tumours that has the propensity for low oxygen levels. This is one of my patients that had ended up having a radical prostatectomy operation. The tumour is outlined in black, and on the left-hand panel, we've stained in brown the cells that have got low oxygen levels. And you can see that this patient has a tumour with very low oxygen levels. Now, not every patient with prostate cancer has oxygen levels as low as this, but many do. And we know from other trials that patients with low oxygen levels at the t in their prostate cancer at the time of their radiotherapy do very badly. Now, this is a, a, a study, and this is a survival curve. 
the lower the graph goes, the worse it is. And in this study of radiotherapy of pro for prostate cancer, patients with low oxygen levels, which is this bottom solid line, did very badly. In fact, three years after their radiotherapy, only 31% of those patients were disease-free. And that is in stark comparison to the top line, the dotted line, which shows that 92% of patients that had high oxygen levels at the time of their radiotherapy were disease-free three years after their radiotherapy. And this study has been repeated several times using different measures of oxygenation, and the results have always been the same. So low oxygen levels at the time of prostate radiotherapy um, mean a bad outcome. So when I was in the lab, I decided to do some experiments to investigate whether very simple techniques, such as breathing a high oxygen content gas, could improve the oxygen levels in prostate cancer. I started with two mouse models, and I got the mouse to mice to breathe high oxygen content gas. And lo and behold, when you switch the gas on, the oxygen level in their prostate cancer improves, you switch the, the gas off, and it goes back to normal. And it happened in both of the mouse models. So I took it across to the clinic and tried it in some prostate cancer patients. And the same thing happened. You switch the gas on and the oxygenation in their prostate cancer improves. Very simple stuff. So at the point that we are at at the moment, we know that radiotherapy requires oxygen to be effective. We know that prostate cancer has the propensity to have low oxygen levels, at least in some patients. We know that patients with low oxygen levels during their radiotherapy do badly. And we now know that actually you can do something about it by getting patients to breathe high oxygen content gas during their radiotherapy. And that's what this trial is all about. We're simply going to put all the science together and we're going to take a group of patients that are having our standard gold standard radiotherapy of intensity modulated radiotherapy to their prostate, their seminal vesicles, and their pelvic lymph nodes, and we are going to add high oxygen con a high oxygen content gas called carbogen, which is 98% oxygen and 2% carbon dioxide, which the patients will breathe for 10 minutes before each radiotherapy flat fraction and during each radiotherapy fraction for the whole duration of their radiotherapy. In addition, we'll give them a tablet called nicotinamide, which is a vitamin. It's vitamin B3. It's nothing special. You can go down to Boots or Sainsbury's and buy nicotinamide for yourself. It's a, uh, a multivitamin, but it seems to improve the oxygen, uh, it improves the blood flow uh, to prostate tumours and allow more of this oxygen-enriched blood to get into the tumours. And we're going to see whether this is effective and we're going to see whether this technique changes the side effect profile of prostate radiotherapy. So this is a very simple study, and it's based on science. But in addition, it's extremely cost-effective. Radiotherapy for prostate cancer costs anywhere between 8,000 and 20,000 pounds per patient, depending on how high-tech you want to be. The addition of carbogen gas and nicotinamide tablets adds less than 100 pounds to that process. <coughs> Also, it's very versatile. It doesn't matter what new kit we get, whether it's CyberKnife, intensely modulated radiotherapy, or whatever's coming in a few years' time. We can always add oxygen enrichment to their radiotherapy. It's future-proof. Now, do we have a realistic expectation that this may succeed? Well, we've actually just completed at Mount Vernon a very similar study using carbogen and nicotinamide and we found that, that patients who had bladder radiotherapy for bladder cancer in conjunction with carbogen and nicotinamide, 13% more people were alive five years after their radiotherapy than those patients that didn't have carbogen and nicotinamide during their bladder radiotherapy. And there was no difference in the long-term toxicity. So, we really do believe that these simple measures based in science can make a real difference to prostate cancer patients in the very near future. And it's through the generous support of the prostate cancer charity and people like yourselves that have allowed this science to turn into the reality of a clinical trial. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.